Welcome back to Gaelic Games Fan TV. It is the weekend recap show. Myself and Matthew Hurley from the Gaelic Statsman podcast are going to be running through all the weekends. Big action, big talking points, and there certainly is plenty to discuss. You obviously had Mayo's big win versus Roscommon. Dublin ending Derry's unbeaten streak. Big wins for Kerry and Galway as well. And of course, the permutations for the likes of Monaghan and Roscommon, um, who look almost, well, Monaghan looked dead and buried. Roscommon maybe still have a slight chance, but even at that, them two are certainly looking like the two sides who are going to go down. Some big results in Division 2. Obviously, Cork beating Kildare. It very much means that Cork should be okay in terms of staying up in Division 2, um, whereas Kildare, in more ways than one, are uh, are almost dead and buried, it, uh, it must seem. But yeah, be running through all the games from Division 1, 2, 3 and 4. And um, yeah, joined here by Matthew Hurley. And uh, it is his birthday as well. So anyone tuning in, make sure to to wish uh, Mr. Matthew Hurley his, uh, you know, his happy birthday. What what age do you turn today? You see, you're getting old. Fucking hell. Yeah, Jesus. Thanks for having me on again, Aaron. But uh, I remember, though, I think I started going on this channel in particular in 2020. With an interview with Car Football, it was one of your first podcast episodes. I distinctly remember that. I was 19 at the time. I'm 23 now today, so it's a mm. uh, it's a long ago. And um, yeah, getting slowly but surely into the um, mature stage, the adulthood stage, nearly finished college as well. So yeah, I think I'm going into the big bad world now. So yeah, and um, my childhood days are well and truly gone, Aaron, and I'm getting old. Oh, there you go. We'll slow down. Well, look, I funnily enough, I turned 29 on Wednesday. So, um, you know, like that's, you know, you, you, you still have plenty to go. You still have plenty to go. Don't worry about that. Denise says happy birthday. Matthew. Thanks, yeah, Denise. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I suppose the fact Cork winning at the weekend as well makes it all that bit more special. It does actually, yeah. And even uh, two two of my other sports teams, actually, um, Liverpool and St. Mirren, both won as well in soccer. So it was a great birthday weekend, I have to say. Brilliant um, for them to them sides to win. And um, yeah, um, going well with the course and everything like that as well. Seems to be less of a hectic week as well. So yeah, just enjoying the birthday week. And yeah, it's it's going well at the moment. It's going well. Um, maybe we'll all turn um, in the next few days, but we'll have to wait and see. Absolutely, yeah. Keane says here, a very good win for the Dubs. And what a save by Hanlon to deny Shane McGuigan. Yeah, it was right behind that goal um, when when that instance happened. And yeah, it was a, a wonderful save from uh, Dave O'Hanlon. Uh, in fairness, Gaelic Guy says, Cork gifts a, a birthday present for once. Mead man, happy birthday, Matthew. Single-handedly re- repaired Mead. Cork relations by backing us uh, in the league this year. Yeah, look, fair play. Uh, I certainly didn't back them anyway, so uh, I don't know what that means for me. But um, yeah, we will get on to Mead a little bit later, actually, because I was actually, yeah, I was very impressed with Mead in fairness. And I do think I was uh, I was very wrong about predicting them to uh, to get relegated. But yeah, I suppose we'll start with uh, Kerry's win versus Tyrone. It was Kerry 18 points, Tyrone 111, a uh, fairly feisty game, I suppose you would say. In more ways than one, like David Clifford nearly getting his, uh, you know, he had to change his, I don't even know if he did change his shirt in the end, but he certainly, you know, his shirt was getting ripped left, right and centre. Um, like Tyrone had some, certainly had some good moments in the game. Um, they certainly had, you know, certain showed signs of quality, like Dara Canavan uh, doing uh, his bits once again. Um, but Kerry just had way too much firepower and they just pulled away more and more that this game went on. And in particular, I thought Paddy Clifford was uh, was very good in this game. Yeah, Kerry were were excellent in many ways. Uh, Tyrone, it, it was a Tyrone esque performance more than anything more than an iron. And um, we talked about their inconsistencies last week, and it's definitely boiled up again. There was some good patches in the end when Kieran Daly got a goal. Uh, Rory Canavan got a point. Star Canavan was putting the balls over the bar, but it was too little, too late, and Kerry. You know, ease to victory in many ways. Uh, David Clifford was brilliant, as he mentioned, with the, even with uh, the rip short. He was absolutely on fire. And uh, you look at Paddy Clifford, Sean O'Shea, and that kind of problem for Kerry boiled once again because out of the 18 points that Kerry scored, 15 came from the three lads again. So maybe Kerry needs to improve on, you know, spreading the scores a small bit. Darren Moynihan got a point. Sean O'Brien got a point, to be fair to him. And it's Adrian Spillane as well. But 
they need more scores. That's what I'm trying to say about uh, this carry team. Like they still have some three excellent players there, Paddy, David, and Sean O'Shea, but they need to spread it uh, a bit more. But it was a brilliant win, brilliant win for them, and it eased any relegation concerns that Kerry had. I, I don't think Kerry had any. Let's be honest. I don't think they ever go down in Division One. But it was just good to get the win. Good to get the win in Killarney in front of their home patch. And to be honest with the brawl, you were expecting it really. Kerry and Tyrone. Every time they face each other, there's some sort of a brawl happening. Like, there was a brawl happening in the quarterfinal last year, um, in Crow Park near um near the Cusack end. I remember that uh, at half time when we talked to Ron, was, you know, both Kerry's friend in the second half, but then Kerry um, ran steamrolling on them in the second half. So that didn't end well. Um, I think there was a bit of fight in Heaney Park last year as well. There was a few years ago with David Clifford got sent off. So I think they're guaranteed whenever these sides come up against each other, there's going to be a fight or a brawl or some sort of fisticuffs going on in the game. But look, Kerry won't care. They've got over the line. And as for Tyrone, I'd love to see that Tyrone commenter um, this week because he says Tyrone are all the contenders and league contenders and all that. And he was calling our journalism pretty poor. I'd love to see his comments now this week after losing against Kerry and really outplayed at times against uh, Kerry and Canary. Yeah, look, um, absolutely, I, I do agree. Um, and like to be fair, it's given Thrawn plenty of praise last week. Um, but I, I suppose you can't, you can't always uh, uh, please everyone. But um, yeah, it was an interesting comment here actually from a Gaelic guy who says, uh, not that one actually, sorry. Yeah, uh, how did Clifford not get sent off? It's a bit stupid to push the Thrawn fella over. Yeah, like thoughts, thoughts on that. Like it was a you know a few handbags, scuffles, and everything else. I I don't necessarily think it it warranted a red card. Um, you know, I think like things start getting a little bit nitpicky and everything else. But what did you think? No, I don't think it was a red card. If you're going to give red cards for that, it's it's incredibly harsh. And uh, Clifford, you know. He's obviously going to lose rag at times of the game because everybody's going to target David Clifford. He's Kerry's best player. He's the defender that you have to stop. And Tyrone will do everything to push his buttons. And look, Clifford, if that's all he did, like, like I, I, I mean, he could have easily um, gave Tyrone uh, the Tyrone fella a harder slack if he if he wished to, but he held it in, and he's still, you know, um. What's up, George? See, yeah, he's, it was just a minor push. I don't think it was a red card whatsoever. And uh, people may forget this. Dar Dar McCurry, um, he's a carry player more seriously last year in the other quarterfinal and stayed on the pitch. So, you know, if you're if you're going to give red cards like that to David Clifford, I mean, it's it's just absolutely wrong. Uh, any player in, for that in, for that matter of interest, but yeah, I don't think it was a red card. I think it was a bit of a pity, um, you know, uh pity kind of a brawl kind of a thing and yeah I think Clifford just deserved to stay out of the pitch and to be honest if Clifford got sent off Kerry would have been in a bit of bother and um, going out to 14 men but look he stayed on the pitch he scored eight points and ultimately yeah I don't think it was a sending off whatsoever if it was going to be a red card it would have been harsh yeah absolutely no I do agree as well I can uh, black card yeah maybe but I, I don't know it wasn't really a like I suppose it was a deliberate push so it's one of them if it was given as a black card then 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 fair enough but i don't think it was uh was a red card and fairness derek was saying here lads you're you're so young uh yeah look we we, we do we do we do have plenty plenty of time left still you know plenty of time left still uh in uh in in fairness but um but yeah in terms of like we'll get the league table up in a minute like in terms of tyrone obviously two wins so far i mean Obviously, they play Monaghan next week, and that's an absolutely gigantic game because, um, like Monaghan do look dead and buried. But if Monaghan were to win that, then it, it could upset the the whole table altogether, and, and Throne could potentially actually go below Monaghan on the head to head. Um, could you see Throne being in a bit of bother in terms of relegation going into these final two games, or do you think they still have enough to to get themselves over? I think they could be in a bit of bother considering the Monaghan game. We expected the Monaghan, we'll get on to Monaghan Galway in a bit, but uh, just um, a bit of context. Maybe people during the week would have said that Monaghan, the spark is going to come against Galway. It just didn't come. So is it going to come in match day six against Tyrone? And it's the Rose to Rivals as well. So, I mean, it's going to be a feisty encounter and Tyrone have to be ready. That's more than anything. If they're not ready, I think it could be a difficult day in the office for them because the one thing that we 
one um, discredit about Tyrone is the quality. There are quality players, and Brian Duger is as passionate as any person is about Tyrone football, and the effort is there. The problem is the consistency. One week they perform well against Mayo, the next week Kerry will play them, another week they do well against Ross Common, and then Dublin hammer them another week. It's just so mm. unpredictable in Tyrone. And uh, what I will say about this as well. If Monaghan do beat them in March day six, I think against Dublin and Crow Park is going to be a massive task to overcome them, the form they're on. So, yeah, it's a crucial game against Monaghan. If they win, I think they're safe. But if they lose, they could be a bit of bother. And I know Monaghan are performing badly at the moment, but they've been in this situation before and they've dragged themselves out of it. Tyrone mm-hmm. don't necessarily have the same you know, experience in dealing with the pressures that Monaghan have had in the past. So, it could be a tricky assignment for Tyrone next day out. It could be, it could be. And Monaghan did beat Tyrone as well last time. The two sides played each other in Ulster as well. So um, there is obviously that um, factor going into the game as well. The game in uh, uh, Celtic Park, Derry 111, Dublin 116. Um, as I said in my match reaction yesterday, I was at the game and there will be a, a vlog out hopefully uh, tomorrow if all goes well. Yeah, look, I mean, I think Dublin played very, very well um, from start to finish. We started by far the, the better side. Derry, obviously, were missing a, a number of key players, but I think it's important to remember that Dublin were also missing a, a number of key players in terms of James McCarthy, Mick Fitzsimons, Stephen Cluxton, Paul Mannion, Colin Baskell. Yes, Derry were obviously missing Connor Glass, Garrett McKinless, Owen McAvoy. I think Paul Cassidy was who came off the bench late on. Um, so they were look. They were certainly missing key players, obviously, as well. Um, but look at Dublin in the end. I thought were by far better. I mean, Derry certainly had good moments. Um, but I think Dublin did give Derry a, a bit of a reality check. I think on uh, on Saturday evening, they did certainly. And um, yeah, Dublin shutting us all up again. And uh, what a performance! And what I will say. Who was going to stop this Dublin team right now? Um, Kerry were the team to stop a few weeks ago, but you look at this Dublin side that Conor Callan's performing with, Cormac Costello coming off the bench with a goal, Kieran Kilkenny was superb the other night, I have to say. And when we talk about the attackers for Dublin, the defence was just as good, because even in the first half, I did some stats here, 16 attacks for Derry in that half, nine ended up in shots, and seven were turned over by Dublin. That's just under half turned over by Dublin. Like, that's incredible. In his own right, like even without Mick Fitzsimons, James McCarthy, Jack McCaffrey, there, there's players that are standing up. Lee Gannon, who unfortunately got a bit of an injury at the end, and hopefully, hopefully Lee does recover. Owen Merchant was superb. Tio, I, I know Tio Clancy didn't start. Brian Howard came into the team and did very well around um, the midfield area. Um, like they were very, very good. You couldn't fall Dublin in any, any way. And even when Derry had their purple patch, Conor McCluskey getting a superb goal in the first half. Dublin still didn't lose their concentration. They still did the uh, things properly. And yeah, a, a, a kind of um, an unusual start in regards to Derry. They scored their first point from play in additional time in the first half. I think it was through uh, Emma Bradley. So, like, you wouldn't see that from a Derry team in the past. So, it, that was an incredible start for Dublin to take forward. It, when Cormac, Cormac Costello got that goal in the second half, you were thinking, that's it. Dublin have this wrapped. And, they look really, really good at the moment. And it was almost like a training session towards the end of us, in all honesty. And yes, Derry were missing Connor Glass. And yes, they were missing Paul Cassidy at the start. And maybe didn't take it as seriously as they would have done in other games. But Dublin still have to play what's in front of them. And that was a really, really good performance in Celtic Park. And yeah, I'd say Dublin fans, including yourself and Seamus, would be absolutely thrilled with that result. And yeah, I, I don't know who's going to stop you now, Aaron, uh, at this particular moment in time. Will it be... Will it be Derry? Will it be Kerry? But what I would say would be interesting if it's a Derry Dublin final in the, in the league final in Crow Park. Will Derry take it seriously then? Like it'd be interesting to see that if, if it was transfer. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see if Dublin maybe bring back some of so, some of their bigger players as well. It could make it could make it a really really big game. Um, just Greed says Dublin made Derry, uh, made Derry look fairly one dimensional. If Dublin beat Galway, they might take it easy against Tyrone on the final day. Potentially, yeah, but there is a lot of teams like in on a similar points bracket, and I do think the difference, and it probably just goes to show the way the provincial championships are at times. Like, I mean, for example, the teams in Ulster and the teams in Connacht probably don't want to be getting to a league final because of the fact that you're going into 
the province where it's going to be tough to, to get through it and win it and everything else. Whereas the likes of Dublin and Kerry, you know, like they can, they like playing in the league final isn't really going to matter too much for them, uh, in in my opinion. Albeit, look, Mead, are, Mead have shown a good bit of form and, and Dublin could potentially play Mead away in the opening uh, in, in the quarter final of the Leinster Championship. But you would still expect Dublin to be to be far too comfortable to uh, to come through it. Gaelic guy says Dublin were dominant, but nothing to get too concerned about. Uh, Derry, uh, Gaelic football pro says Derry were missing a good few of their key players. Definitely were putting it up against Dublin. As does show we need a bit more depth in our squad. Fair play to uh, to Dublin. Yeah, look, there's definitely no panic stations. I don't think from uh, from a Derry perspective and, and chatting to Derry fans and everything after the game. You know, Derry have already done the bulk of their work in this league. Um, you know, four wins. In many ways, this the defeat could potentially help them going going down the line because it could be a, a bit of a, a learning curve. Um, you know, like I think sometimes you know you need to lose games in order to learn a bit more. Um, and uh, and I don't necessarily think this is a bad game to lose because I don't think it will have that big big a big of an effect on on the season. But could there have been an argument maybe that Mickey Hart was being a bit cute and sort of held back a lot more of the the senior players with the fact that Derry and Dublin. Could very well play each other in the league final, but also thinking of the big picture, like depending on draws and everything else. I mean, it could be very likely Dublin and Derry clash again in an all around semi final, final, or maybe a quarter final. Who knows? But it's it could be likely these two play each other again at some point further down the line. Yeah, and it was it was kind of interesting to see that Derry didn't announce their team until a few minutes before throwing as well. Um, that was quite interesting and. Um, we've had this discussion about the Tipperary Hurlers announcing their team, I think it was uh, on Friday evening or whatever. Derry announced their team, I think, a few hours before the game, which you could argue that was cute enough for Mickey Hart um, to leave us all guessing, will Conor Glass star? Will we have that battle with Conor Glass and Brent Brian Fenton that we were all hoping for? And then Conor Glass, you see him in the tracksuit, not starting the game, but still kicking your own to football. And you're like, what's going on here? But, um, but yeah, he's... He is cute in his, his own right, but at the same time, yeah, like they were on eight points. The rest of the teams had four points. They weren't going to go behind any team, no matter what happened last weekend. So, yeah, like, of course, they were going to take the game lightly in many ways. And uh, it was a surprise, actually, the fact they didn't start um, Connor Glass. Maybe they could have rested, rested Shane McGuigan and took it even more cuter, if, if you know what I mean there. So, so yeah, it was... Um, it was it was interesting in its own right, but what is probably the dominating factor for Derry? They need Connor Glass in midfield if they're going to go anywhere. If they're going to claim an All Ireland title, they need that guy in midfield because the form he's been on for what the Graham's gain for Derry, um, over the past few weeks, like they need him in midfield, no doubt about it. But then again, we might say that Mickey Hart would have been resting Connor Glass for this game because maybe the bulk of the work was done, as we mentioned. He's been. He's been absolutely going non-stop at Watley Grimm's Glen ever since July mm-hmm. in the Globe Championship. And he played a st- he played in the all Ireland semi-final, of course, last year against Kerry. So he hasn't had a prolonged period of rest for a long time. Yes, he got a bit of rest fighting the Cigarettes and Cup when he wasn't picked for Ulster University, which they won, by the way. But, but like, maybe he needs that bit of rest, but maybe that bit of rest, maybe it will do him in the next few weeks. And... Once we see a Connor Glass on form, a Shane McGuigan on form, and a Shane McGuigan who's the top scorer of the league at the moment, like Derry will be an an, an unbelievable prospect. That's the thing with this uh, Derry team. But yeah, um, I think honestly, I think I think Glass needed the rest. I didn't think it'll come in this game against Dublin, but you know what, Mickey Hart, he's an unpredictable coach, and he's pulled it off again. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I don't. I think you you fully understand resting Connor Glass, but maybe for this game was a little bit unusual. But then again, with the fact they already have eight points on the board, and again with the with the fact that these two are very likely potentially to play each other, maybe even a couple of weeks. You know, may, maybe there is an element of let's just hold Connor Glass in in reserve and some of the other lads a little bit. Um, I do think Garrett McInnes is an injury. To be fair, maybe maybe a few others have injuries as well, but. Um, but there we go. Alan says Dublin could have could well have a clean sweep this year, and more more, uh, uh, more players to come back, uh, so they will be up for it. And Derek says Dublin passing and intricate movement in Pac Derry own half, especially uh, for goal. Yeah, look, I mean Dublin, it, it's it's a great run of form. Like they've beaten 
you know, the two other sort of all Ireland, heavy all Ireland contenders in, in Kerry and Derry, fairly comfortable back to back. Um, and it, and it does seem like all of all of Dublin's team is is performing right now. Like, would you agree with with some of those comments there that Dublin are looking unbeatable at the minute and that they're they're now the like the heavy favourites for, for for the All Ireland? Or is it a case maybe that you know it, it is the league and everything else? And we've saw great teams. We've saw teams go on great runs in the league in the past. Mayo in particular last year, and we all saw how that turned out. So. Could there be an argument maybe that we shouldn't also get too carried away with Dublin or, or what do you think? Not only are Dublin performing well at the moment uh, with the team that they have, they're performing well without the likes of Cluxton, McCarthy, McCaffrey, Fitzsimons, um, a few others as well. Like he, he, the, the newer players are coming into it, which is a big thing. Lee Gallen, as, you mean, as we mentioned earlier, Owen Merchant, uh, Ross McGarry, Larkin O'Dell even got a point, could have even got a goal the other night against Derry. What's the most pleasing aspect I imagine from, from your point of view and from Seamus or any Dublin fans point of view is these younger players stepping up now, like Pat O'Coffey Byrne for example, hasn't really kicked on since he's under 20, under 20 exploits, but he has done in the last few weeks. You look at other players as well, Tio Clancy did well against Kerry last week. You mean you have, you have Ross McGarry there, you have Larkin O'Dell, Lee Gannon, as, as we mentioned, and hopefully he recovers soon. David O'Hanlon even in gold, and while we're on David O'Hanlon, that was a brilliant save against Shane McGuigan. Like he could have easily let that in and like, oh, to hell with this, but no, he had to pull the dramatics. Brilliant save from him, really good save. And um, like that's the scary thing for, for this Dublin team. Like they're without Fitzsimons, they're without the leaders in the back, Clucks in particular who, you know, organised the back line and cans it down a small bit. They struggled without them guys last season in the league. Let's not forget in Division 2. But once mm-hmm. they're without these guys now, and they're performing excellent. So imagine when these guys come back. Like, this is going to be a, a really, really, a, you know, a kind of a dominating double display in the next two weeks. And what I would say about the Leinster Championship in particular, I do think Mead will bring the fire in part Hudson. They're that kind of a team. They want to make it into a bear pit against Dublin, but then Dublin will have enough to get get themselves out of the situation that they have been in. And that's not a disrespect to Mead whatsoever. It's just that Dublin are that good at the moment, and that's the way they they are playing. They're really really good, and I don't see anybody stopping them at this current juncture. But then again, at the start of the league campaign, I said there was no stopping Kerry with the three guys in forwards. So you never know in the next few weeks. Yeah, it has been a very inconsistent league. Like it felt like it was only a couple of weeks ago where people were talking about Dublin maybe being in a in a relegation battle. So th- things do seem to be swinging and changing very quickly. But um, like anyone who who would have saw my reaction after the Mayo game, I actually I remember saying I thought Dublin played very well and I was very confident that they could get themselves out of it. I never thought this would happen now in terms of beating Kerry. And Derry so um so comfortably, but uh, but there we go. But you're mentioning there about all the big players coming back. Like, is there an argument that maybe like Cluxton, I think, comes back into the team just because of who he is and everything else? Albeit, I think David O'Hanlon was outstanding yesterday. His kickouts were superb. The save was absolutely brilliant. Um, and maybe it's a little bit unfortunate that you do have uh, you know a legend of the game and Stephen Cluxton just sort of waiting there in the background to come back in. But is there an argument maybe that James McCarthy, Mick Fitzsimons, Pascal, Mannion, like all the other lads are playing so well? Like, like I don't, I don't necessarily think they come straight back in. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good argument. Actually, I, I think just for experience, I think Fitzsimons has to be there. Theo Clancy did play well against Kerry last week, but Fitzsimons, I think for one or two more seasons, he still has to be in this team. You look at James McCarthy, Keen Murphy's performing out of his skin at the moment. So how could you drop him? Like he did very well in Polly Clifford in particular in the last game against Kerry. And where does James McCarthy fit? Like even Brian Howard, does he go back into midfield? Would you replace Pat or Corvick Byrne and bring him out? On his current development, maybe not. Um, you look at Paul Mannion, would he come back into the team instead of Ross McGarry on current form? I know Mannion's an outstanding player and has done it year in, year out for Kim McCall and for Dublin. But McGarry's outstanding at the moment. Really, really good performances from him. Colin Baskin as well. Nine, would you have him instead of nine scrolling? Like that's the that's a good headache for Desi Farrell to have to Aaron. Because like all these players are playing well. And then there's older lads to step up in a notch. Like Colin Baskin was the top scorer from play last year. Like if you were to drop him in the championship, that'd be almost crazy talk. 
But even if you explain the context behind it, like Niall Scully is performing so well, Ross McGarry is performing well, Lorcan O'Dell can't get into the team and he's performing well, Dar Lucan can't get into the team, he's performing well. So all these Dublin players are going really, really well, but it's unfortunate that there is 15 lads there. Now, Hanlon's the most unfortunate, in my opinion, and I've said this last year. It's just, a, it's really, really unfair of him that he's coming up against the best goalkeeper that we've ever seen in Cluxton. Because if he didn't, he'd be straight into this team. He's really, really impressed. In Division 2 last season, remember his save for Brian Hurley and Parky Heave? That saved Dublin uh, from embarrassment in many ways, going down to Cork and uh, losing potentially. And ever since, Dan O'Hanlon has kicked on. Ever since, but I know he had the blip when Cluxton came back into the team and there was a bit of co- and rumours about his confidence and things like that. But then he's come back to the team for this Division 1 campaign and he's been superb on kickouts, on saves. He's probably, like, arguably, I know he's only the second goalkeeper in Dublin, but arguably he's one of the best shot stoppers in the country, Ohana. So, like, he's an absolutely brilliant goalkeeper. There's some brilliant players there as well. And, yeah, this team is going to be very, very difficult to get into come championship time. Like, even look at the players that came on, Greg McEnany, Yakili McGuinness, who came on late. Like, he's not even getting a look in, and he performed well for TU Dublin. Uh, Tom Lahiff came out at halftime. He's contributing. So the whole panel are chipping in. And that is a positive for Jesse Farrell in the back of you might imagine. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, like, and, and one player you didn't mention as well was was Jack McCaffrey, who still has to come back yeah. potentially as well. Like, that's another player. Um, so, yeah, look, it's um, it's certainly great times from, uh, from, a, from a Dublin perspective at the minute. And... Um, yeah, hope hopefully it does it does continue for from my point of view anyway. But I'm sure uh, rival fans and everything else will uh, disagree. Mayo got their league campaign back on track with a big result uh, against Roscommon, 15 points to nine. They put back to back defeats behind them with uh, with this victory. And yeah, it was like Roscommon had a couple of moments in the first half where they looked like they were going to make a game of it but Mayo looked very very comfortable um Ryan O'Donoghue very good once again Fergal Bowling very impressive and yeah look um I suppose I was chatting to a Mayo man uh, on on Friday and he was telling me you know we need to put some manners into these Roscommon lads after what they did to them uh, last year and yeah, look, Mayo did that. You know, they got their revenge. Um, albeit, I know they still have to play each other. I think again in a couple of a couple of weeks' time. Um, so that will really be the the game. I think that matters the most. But yeah, big result for for Mayo, and it, it puts any slight relegation concerns. I don't think there was any anyway. But any slight relegation concerns, it puts that to bed. The funny thing about this game coming into it and doing previews and all that is if Roscommon managed to win this game, they would have been at five points and Mayo would have been at four. And suddenly Mayo are embroiled in a relegation dogfight and Roscommon are safe. But it was just crucial that Mayo got over the line here. Um, Like like Bob Toohey performed well, Fergal Boland as well, and Moila Mollen. 11 points for playing the league. Like, is he probably the most improved player in Division 1? I certainly think so. Like, he didn't even get on the Mayo panel last year, never mind the team. And now he's performing well, scoring 11 points in five games from plays. Absolutely outstanding. And it's a credit to him as well for coming back into the team. Ryan who did well, obviously. Like, you have Aidan O'Shea, performed probably his best game since last season as well. Was a colossal figure. And yeah, Mayo got over the line. They did what they had to do and uh, they won this game. And a canter, really. Donald Cumbie Q was really good at wing back as well, I have to say, the other night. But for Ross Common, relegation fears they up it again because they have to face Kerry next. And Kerry might be wanting to strike their peak about now when they get into the championship. So, no, it doesn't look good for Ross Common um, in the, the next few weeks. They're on three points. We talk about Monaghan being in broad in a relegation dogfight. Ross Common, th- that result against Monaghan is certainly history now. It's going to be a massive week for them in the next in the next few weeks them in relegation survivor mode. But for Mayo, could there be a league final on the cards? They face against like Kerry, Dublin, Mayo, Derry, all of the top four. And what we're on this Aaron, do we have our top four? Is that the top four of the country? I certainly think so. There's no doubts about the top three in Derry, Kerry, and Dublin. But would you join Mayo into that b- bracket as well? Because Kevin McStay has done a good job. They were lucky last season. Fergal Bowl is performing well. Ryan O'Donoghue is as well. I know there's a bit of inconsistency with Mayo, but I certainly think they're a better team than Throne. So 
I know Tyrone won the last game before anybody comes at me, but I just think that was an underperforming Mayo team the last time and they were away from home in Oma. But in a normal circumstance game where Mayo performed to their peak, I think Mayo are a better team than Tyrone. So I think we do have our top four currently in uh, Division 1 and it's probably the top four that we might be hoping for come all Ireland semi-final time. Yeah, like I think... Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I probably like Tyrone at their best. I'd probably still put them above Mayo. Um, and I think the last couple of results over the, over, over this year, I think the last couple of, I don't know Mayo beat them in the league last year, but but then again, I don't think there's much really between them when they're both both at it. I do think Mayo have a bit more consistency than Tyrone, specifically since obviously 2021. Um, and especially in the last two years, I know I'll be a Mayo lost in the auto and quarter final, but overall they they were still far more consistent when you look at their league form um as well. But yeah, no, like I'd put Dublin, Derry, Kerry, like in whatever order you want to put them in. I think they are the top three. I think most people have said that for the majority of the year. Um and then I think you've got a couple of teams slightly underneath. I think Mayo on their day can give anyone a game, but I just don't know if they have completely what it takes in terms of their squad and forwards wise like yeah fair enough Fergal Boland's look good Ryan O'Donoghue's obviously a talent um, I think if you can start getting Tommy Conroy back to his best um, f- and find some sort of a plan for Aidan O'Shea if you can Mayo could come closer to the pack but look one thing is for certain they they are going to be like one thing like from a neutral perspective is I want to see Mayo have a good championship because I think it does make the championship better and I think it would be it, it it would be interesting to see them going up against a Dublin or a Derry or a Kerry when they're at their best because I think they can give them as good as a game as anyone can. Um, but it's just that age old thing with Mayo that in big championship games, you know, since they beat Dublin in twenty twenty one, it's 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 all just not 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 worked, you know. So it's they're they're a hard one to judge, but I don't think anyone is doubting their their ability. People might seem to forget this as well. Like Division 1 last year, they were exemplary. They won nearly every game. They only lost to Bonham on the final day when they played a second team. And then in the championship, I was down in the game against Kerry and Killarney. And I looked at Mayo coming out of the stadium that day thinking, I turned around to somebody I was at the game with, and I thought, I know Mayo have their inconsistency, but I think I've seen all Ireland champions there. They looked fit. They looked fitter than Kerry. They looked hungrier than Kerry. And I'm just questioning to myself, how on earth they went from that level against Kerry to down there against Lowell and Cork? I'm actually not sure what happened there. And um, like, if Mayo, like, put it this way, if Mayo performed like they did against Kerry, against Cork and the Gator Grounds, Mayo would have wiped Cork um, to asunder because they're that type of team. Like, Owen McLaughlin was performing well against Kerry that day. You Killian O'Connor, Ryan O'Donoghue, Ma- Matthew Rowan, Jordan Finn was in the form of his life that day and he's capable of putting in very good performances and you obviously had Fergal Bowler to the category there as well they beat Galway in the first half against Dublin in the quarterfinal they were hanging in there and then Colin Baskill gets that goal um, in the first half and then Mayo start to wilt then he gets the second goal and then the chances are completely gone so I think Mayo in general I do think they have the players they have the manager they have the talent they have the forwards and defenders. Like Rory Brickenton's an outstanding player in the full back line as well. In the Hessian, um, Sam Cannon's a really good find in the last few seasons. Stephen Cohen, Paddy Durkin, Dermot O'Connor. There are some excellent players in the Mayo team that have named off the sheet there. The problem is consistency. And we've seen this with Mayo over the last few seasons. Can they produce the same performance level as they do in Killarney against Kerry against a team like a Loud, a Cork, um, uh, it's, who else would I put in there Ross Common would be definitely in, in that bracket as well to be fair they beat them the other night but they lost them in the Connacht Championship last season so like that's the key thing with Mayo they do have the players consistency is a bit of a question though but I still believe in this Kevin McStay project there's still surely a kick in this Mayo team absolutely yeah Denise says Com- here Com Reaps Save was fierce, yeah. uh, great goalie. How did he cover so much ground to run back to goal? Outstanding, hasn't conceded a goal in the league so far. Impressive, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And yeah, I suppose it was certainly a weekend for goalkeepers stopping uh, lobbed balls and, and everything else. Um, and and calm reap, yeah, that was a, that was a fantastic save. And even his point at the start of the game as well was was very impressive. Um, Gaelic guy says here, I think Roscommon are doomed now because they have to play. 
Kerry and Derry. Um, Gaelic Football Pro says Roscommon are looking like they're going down. Unfortunately, they were so good last season, finishing third. I don't see them staying up. Um, no disrespect. Gavin says Dora stuff. Roscommon came back in it, but gave up. Not like the Burke team, more like Roscommon of old. We're back to yo yoing again. Yeah, like where where has it gone wrong for Roscommon? Like, could it maybe have been a case that they overachieved a little bit last year? Um, because like, like, like looking at their team, like it's more, it is it, like they have got more or less their best team out there from what I can see, anyway. Um, I know obviously Kier, Kieran Mert has stepped away, but like generally speaking, it still is a very, very good Roscommon side, a team that caused a, a lot of surprises in, in, in Division One last year. So, where, where has it gone wrong for Roscommon this year, do you think? Hard to know. Well, firstly, I did predict Roscommon to go down because there is a thing, second season syndrome. And I just think, compared to the other team, Roscommon were weaker than the rest. They do have good players, there's no doubt about that. Like, Dar Craig's in the farming side at the moment, despite losing the other night. You have Dermot Morta, you have Connor Cox, you have Rory Fallon, who's coming for the Bridgets team. But what I will say about Roscommon, they're missing the X factor in the last few weeks in Ben O'Carroll. And once he slowly, gradually gets back into the team, maybe you'll see a different size of him. But for right now, it's just, you know, it's drama in many ways because in the first half, I think it was seven, six and a half time, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, if there was a point in it, you were thinking, okay, Ross Common need to go back into the dressing room, regroup and then get back to the second half. But they only scored three points in the latter half. Which was really, really poor. I don't know, was it a fatigue thing? Was it, you know, a confidence thing? I'm not entirely sure. But as the commenter just said there about uh, Kerry and Derry, to face it, them next, it's going to be a difficult task for them to stay up next season. But in terms of the championship, I've said this always Ross Common have the potential. Look at the team that they do have and the manager known David Burke, Davy Burke. They have the potential of getting to the all the semi finals. Look at Monaghan last season. Look at Derry in the last few seasons. But Ross Common, the old kind of feeling with them, they perform well against these bigger opposition. And it's almost the same as Toronto and Mayo in many aspects. They perform well against, let's say, a Mayo, a Galway, um, a Tyrone, a Dublin last season in the all the group stage. But then they lose to Kildare and Cork and Clare the season before and throw that all good work down the drain. I, I'm not sure when Ross Common do that particularly this season, but it, it's still a bit of inconsistency that's in the back of my mind thinking, are Ross Common actually ready to take the next step? They do certainly have the players, as I mentioned there, but do they have the mentality? That's my issue with uh, Ross Common right now. Absolutely, yeah. And, and as we were saying there, like with Kerry and Derry to come in the, in the next two games, it's it's certainly not looking too good from uh, a Roscommon perspective. Uh, Galway, huge win for them versus Monaghan. Um, 3-12 to 14 points. Obviously, things looking fairly bleak, it must be said, from a uh, Monaghan perspective. Uh, Rory Cunningham, I thought, was very impressive in this game. Goal and three points um, from him. And I suppose a lot of people have been questioning Galway in terms of not having Shane Walsh, not having uh, Damian Comer. Um, but three goals in the first half, albeit you know, a few of them from Monaghan mistakes and and sort of long balls being floated in and everything else or, or drop balls causing causing a bit of havoc. But fair play to Galway. Like I was very impressed with them actually in this game. Um, and and to be fair to them, a lot of their younger lads stood up and yeah, showed a lot of positive signs for for Galway because I think they've had to answer the question in terms of when Walsh and Comer aren't there over the last three four years. Like I've said it openly i don't think they're the same team and this was actually one of the first times i looked at them and thought do you know what like even w w without them i thought they played very well i expected the garbage source to come sometime in the league did i expect it this weekend no i expected Monaghan to win this game and the one weekend i predict Galway to lose they go on and win and yeah finally they um they perform well, and, and I've been waiting for them to do so, and they did so this weekend. This is the potential that Galway do have. They're a dangerous animal. They do have talented players, like Killian O'Kareen, for example, who scored five points. Rory Cunningham nearly came out of nowhere in this, to be honest with you. 1-3 after no score in the last few games for him, and no game time, more or less. Like, that's an outstanding display, in fairness to him, and well done for, uh, for that. Carl Sweeney and John Marr getting the other goals as well, so you have really good performance from Godwin. They hit the ground running in the first half. 
which Galway didn't do in the last few games. I think, honestly, that was the first time Galway actually laid at half time in this Division 1 campaign because they were losing to Tyrone in earlier in the league campaign when they won the game eventually. So, like, that was a good win for Galway. They was badly needed because they do have Kerry and Dublin in their next two games. They had to win this game to have any chance of staying up. And to be fair to them, they did. They pulled their socks up, even without Comer and Walsh, and they performed well. As for Monaghan, like, I think Seamus Brady made a point on his uh, podcast on, on Clay last night. That if you wipe away the historic relevance and the the last day miraculous recoveries from Monaghan in the past, if you just wipe that out of your memory and you look specifically at the points of the board and the points difference and all that, you would say they're done. So it doesn't look good for Monaghan in that light. But then again, this is the team we're talking about. They have Toronto May on the next uh, two games. They have two more chances to turn their season around. Do Monaghan have the capabilities of it? Yes, they do. Per- with performances at the moment, do they look like they're doing it right now? Probably not. But then again, Aaron, it's so dangerous to back against them, isn't it? Because next game against Throne, they could just snap and perform well. So we'll have to see what happens in the next few weeks. But for right now, for the Farney Army, it doesn't look good for them to stay up. And they need, to, they need a good performance against Throne to have any chance of survival. You think with McCarthy and McManus coming back in? Obviously, came came back into the folds um, uh, against uh, against Galway. Obviously, coming off the bench. I mean, do you reckon they could they could um, make a difference? Possibly. I think Carl McManus has passed it personally, so maybe for experience, maybe in the dressing room. That's why he's been brought back in. As for Conor McCarthy, certainly. Like he could play anywhere along half forward, full forward. Obviously, he excelled at wing back last year. So it's going to be interesting to see where he does play. But yeah, I think them two lads will make a difference. But I think the main misses for them are the Hughes brothers and uh, Roy Began. They're the leaders in the mm-hmm. team. And once they left, I just think, well, I don't know what's the story with Darren Hughes. Is he going back? Maybe Monaghan fans will know more than us about it. Kieran Hughes is definitely gone. Rory Began looks like he performed well in the NFL last night. Fair play to him. And he looks like he's not coming back either. So, yeah, missing them three lads, I think, is massive. And I know McCarthy performed well last season and McManus is a leader in his own right. But once you miss them three type of leaders in, in any team in a small county like Monaghan, it's going to be hard to regain a bit of form. So, like, it's going to be difficult for them without those three lads in particular to have any chance of staying up. But I do think they're making the right steps to recovery in bringing McCarthy back and McManus back. Jack McCarthy scored a lot in the league. There's a lot of um, you know, temptation on his shoulders. Will he prove it in the next few weeks? We'll have to see. But but yeah, I just think Monaghan, it's unfortunate for them because they've been a credit to themselves and a credit to the GA in many ways over the last few seasons, the way they performed. But them three lads in particular, the Hughes and B- and Began, they're three huge losses, and it looks to be taking a toll on them. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And I suppose uh, having a look at the uh, league table, then uh, if we get the uh, Division One table up right there, so as we can see, Derry are obviously still top with eight points. Dublin are into second, but Mayo and Kerry are also there with uh, with six points as well. Galway, I think we would all say, look fairly safe at this point with five points on the board. Throne, Roscommon and Monaghan still all very much in it with Monaghan sitting bottom. Looking at it there, I mean, is it cut and dry, Monaghan and Roscommon to go down? Or do you think either one of them can, can pull it off? I think if there's any one of the two to pull it off, it's Monaghan. I think Roscommon are down considering the next two games they have in Kerry and Derry. That's always going to be difficult. Um, Tyrone, I'm thinking their games now. They have Monaghan in the next game. That's going to be massive. And they also Dublin. have Dublin. Park, yeah, so that's that's a must win for Tyrone already. i just be a lot will depend on the next game. Monaghan and yeah. Tyrone. Whoever wins that, I think is safe. But whoever whoever's on the losing side of it, I think are in massive trouble of going down. And what I did predict at the start of the season, I predicted Tyrone and Roscommon to go down. Will I stick with a prediction? That, that's the thing, you could never back it against Monaghan. You really couldn't. Um, I think Ross Common are down, cut it long story short. It's largely depends on the next game, doesn't it? Monaghan to run. Mm. Yeah. It's a difficult one. Yeah. I'm going to back Toronto to go down. 
I think Monaghan could beat them. So, where is be, that game? Is that game in Healy Park? I'm trying to. I'll have a look now, but it's um, it's going to be interesting actually. If he is in Clonus, then Monaghan have a massive chance. Um, mm. I'm actually not sure the game where it's on. I'm going to check it now, but but like, Toronto need to win it because they have Dublin next in Crow Park. It's going to be a massive game for them. Do I? Oh, I've seen it. No, it's in Healy Park. Healy Park. Mm-hmm. So that could suit Monaghan even more, though. Weirdly, I don't. I don't know why, but um, but they, they like even because their only win was in Crow Park. You know, like they haven't actually won in, in Clonus this year. Like that that strong form that they always seem to have at home doesn't seem to be there. A two says the year you tip Monaghan to stay up, they shit the bed and get battered every game. Well done, lads. Yeah, and I remember even predicting that. And I was like, you know, they're hundred percent going to go down now, aren't they? Um, because that's just, um, that's just how it is. And you know, they, they even had to go and and beat the Dubs as well, just to rub it in that bit further. But there you go. Um, but yeah, look, I think I think the Monaghan Throne game it rests on that, in my opinion, it does, doesn't it? Because um, you know, Throne even get a draw there or a win, and Monaghan are hundred percent down. So. Yeah, it's it's absolutely huge, no doubt about it. And interesting enough, like Monaghan's last game is against Mayo, and I saw Kevin McStay obviously coming out and saying that he doesn't necessarily want a league final. Um, so again, you could have a scenario like last year where Mayo changed their uh, changed their entire team, which would be interesting. We'll move on to Division Two, starting off with Cork, who beat Kildare two fifteen to three nine. Um, massive results for yourselves. Um, takes you more or less out of you know the the relegation dogfight. You're not 100 percent safe yet because you only have two wins on the board. Um, so that there, there certainly is still work to be done. But um, yeah, big big result, and especially like Kildare were five points up after you know seven or eight minutes. They started really strong. Daniel Flynn obviously gets a goal, sets up another goal, obviously as well, set up the goal for Alex Byrne. But fair play to Cork, they came roaring back into it and massive win. Huge win, yeah, and um, it didn't look good at half time. It didn't look good after the uh, first few minutes with Daniel Flynn scored the goal and Alex Byrne got the first as well. It just, you know, the st- the atmosphere around the stadium, it was almost like it was acceptance many ways. I've been going on about in the last few weeks and we did the same things as I described over the last few weeks up until 35 minutes. But once we get to the ball in the 45, we hand pass it back and it's just boring. We run the ball in tackles and you're kind of just willing the players on to go on the counter attack. Then, in additional time in the first half, we turned the ball over from Kildare. Matty Taylor goes steaming down the field, passes it to Tommy Walsh back in the net. That's what happens when you run a teams. And Cork, John Clare must have said that in the dressing room. Keep doing that, lads. It's clearly working. So let's do it again. And you've seen Connor Carbus goal yesterday. It was a brilliant catch by Conor McHallan, I have to say. Plucked it out of the air. I don't know how Cullum actually did that. He didn't pass it straight to Connor Carbus. You see our the quality that he has once he gets in front of the goal. Like he's just a mad, magnificent footballer. And as Amy Fitzmar said in Leeds Sunday last night, it's just vital we keep him fit. Because you see him even at minor level and under 20 level. He's just a Rolls Royce of a footballer. He's so so good to watch. And yeah, he's he's massive. But at the same time, like when Kadir got the penalty harsh, I would think it was a harsh penalty, uh, the fall on Kevin O'Bannon running through on goal. But anyway, Kevin Feely stucks that away and you're thinking, OK, we need to calm this down. But then we kick over the next few points. It was comfortable enough in the end. And to be honest, Aaron, I think it should have been a lot more. We were much the better team over Kildare in the second half. And, but it was nerve-wracking, really nerve-wracking. And uh, But we have two wins on the board now and we should be here to survive it. And yeah, that's the main thing for this car team. And what I would say as well for a car before we move on to Kildare, the sub at half time to bring Rory Dean on was massive because you could see once he got the ball, he was going to pass it in into the forwards with an intricate pass and um, with the outside of his foot. He's just an incredible, um, you know, deliverer of the ball in many ways. And yeah, he's really, really good football. And the pair stood up in fairness the likes of Ian McGuire, the likes of Colin O'Callaghan, the likes of Brian Hurley, to be fair to him. Brian O'Driscoll was very good with three points and linked up to play very well. And um, Tommy Walsh performed well, Kevin Fly. Uh, Daniel O'Mahony at times, Sean Meehan, to be fair to him, when he came on in the first half and since ever since then, had probably one of his best performances of the court chart since the Kerry game where he marked Clifford out of the game. So that's a credit to him. So really good performance with Cork. As for Kildare, 
Luke, I don't think it's all doom and gloom for him. And I said this off air to you. I think the comments that Larry Tonkins made on RT Radio, I think it was, was very, very harsh on them. He said they almost gave up. And to me, it looked like, I just think it's a confidence thing. Once they came wide after wide, if things aren't going your way, they're just not going your way. And the, like, the thing was with Kildare, they were the much better team in the first half. And they could see the goal to Tommy Walsh and Cork must have been a sucker punch for them. Because like they should have been five, six points clear. And you could see that goal. You could see the confidence going to the dressing room just drain away. And as soon as Cork gained a bit of confidence, that was it. And yeah, it was a difficult one to take for Kildare. And it's going to take a miracle for um, a major miracle I mean, I had for Kildare to stay up. But but look, they have very good footballers. It's hard to pinpoint what it is. And they do care about Kildare football. There were fans in, in Parky Key yesterday that cared genuinely cared. Kevin O'Callaghan was brilliant though mm. yesterday at times. Daniel Flynn, whenever he got the ball, was very good. Alex Byrne, Noel Kelly. There are some excellent footballers. It's just frustrating at times to watch them. And I think really unofficial to their um, GA page on Twitter and um, Instagram actually mentioned for the Tommy Walsh goal, stupid mistakes cost us the game. And that was the thing for, for Kildare in many ways. But look, it's a win for Cork. Gets them out of trouble, but for Kildare, it's a defeat that will take them even further to Tata Cup. But maybe not. You look at the Leinster draw, they're away from Mead and Dublin. So maybe there's a chance for them to get to a Leinster final. If they perform like they did, particularly in the first half, I think there's every chance. But the thing is for Kildare, they need to perform well for a full 70 minutes. They haven't done so in the last few games. They have to do so in the next few games to have any hope of staying in the Salmon Gore Cup. Yeah, A2 says, to be fair to Cork, they have at least shown some fight while Kildare just fold every week. It's beyond embarrassing at this point. So much talent flushed down the drain. Like, the thing was, like because they, they obviously get those two early goals, um, but then after that, they kicked, was it two points in, in 30, 40 minutes or, or a period of time like that? I mean, like, that that is the issue like with Kildare and Kildare have been like that for the last two, three years. Like, I mean, you know, it was only a couple of years ago they beat, you know, the likes of Dublin uh, obviously in the league when they were in Division 1 they drew with Kerry as well they had some very very good performances um, when they were in Division 1 even when they got relegated last year they had a couple of um, you know decent results sort of uh, towards the end of the league as well so I don't know what it is like Like Kildare definitely I do agree with you they've got a couple of players there who are very good on the eye the likes of Daniel Flynn Kevin Feely Jimmy Hyland obviously when he's when he's fit and available Derek here one's um, injured obviously at the minute obviously a huge amount of under 20 success like there is players there there is something to work with in Kildare but at the same time I would also agree in in some ways that Kildare way too often they do just like seem to stop playing like and whether it is confidence or whatever like against Armagh they, they conceded a couple of early goals there then they were beaten the game was 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 pretty much over against Fermanagh they just never got going in that game at all and then in this game as soon as they face a bit of adversity, the, like they just absolutely collapse. And like in terms of their defense, in terms of being set up, they just, you know, they look like headless chickens out there um, in, in more ways than one. And yeah, like it's it's one of them with Kildare. There, there, there is players in that county, absolutely no doubt about it, but they look a million miles off being where they should be, in my opinion, which has at least been, you know, competitive at the, at the top level of, of division two. Um, but I, but I think I, I, I don't know. I think confidence wise, they look absolutely all over the place. And even if they were to end up in the Talchin cup, I, I couldn't see them winning it, to be honest. And that is the thing with uh, confidence and all that. As soon as they make a mistake, they start to go into their shell a small bit and they doubt themselves. Like that Tommy Walsh goal yesterday it was well worked by Cork. And finally, we actually attacked the opposition. But from a Kildare point of view, I'd be questioning how on earth did you let Matty Taylor run that length of the pitch before passing to Tommy Walsh? And I think even for Tommy Walsh's goal, I think there was about three Kildare fellas around him. And he's a corner back, let's not forget, to get that goal. It was well taken by Tommy. But like from a Kildare point of view, I'm thinking, how on earth have you conceded that goal? And to go in a point ahead at half time, the doubt starts to creep in then. And then they start making mistake after mistake. There was a few chances. I think Callum Bolton and Mark called it very well at a stage in the second half. And then he kicks it wide. He doesn't usually do that. He didn't do that in the under-20 championship last season. So for him to do, like, I just think it's just a confidence thing. 
And I don't think it's players downing tools. I think the Kildare players genuinely care. I do think there is quality there. I just think, like, as soon as a disastrous moment happens, they just creep back into their shell and they're like, okay, we've, uh, we're, we've made one mistake. Let's not make it again. And they overthink it many, in many ways. And I think there was a situation, I think Mick O'Grady, for um, one of the car points, um, you know, outside of the boot, kicks it across the square, and then Brian O'Driscoll intercepts it. Like, that's just confidence. You know, when things start to go wrong, they go wrong. And it was just poor times for Kildare, like even um, kicking the ball at the, in, for a sideline, like when they were on the attack, running the ball at the challenges. Like, it was almost a bit too easy for Cork at, at times in the second half. It was not as if Kildare didn't care. I think they did care, and I re-emphasise that point because I think it's very important. But I just feel it is confidence. And if they get, they, if they get confidence for 70 minutes in a game, I think they'll run muck on any opposition, especially in the Tadson Cup, if they are at that stage. But I still think there is potential in this team to beat a load of Westmeat. I know Lowell and Westmeat, to be fair, if them are doing well. But if Kildare perform to their utmost ability for 70 minutes with no errors, no lapses in concentration, and no drops in confidence, I do think Kildare are a serious force to be reckoned with. So, like, but it's a lot of suburbatives, definitely. But I do think it is possible for Kildare to turn this around. Do I think it will be under Glenn Ryan's stewardship in the next uh, week, few weeks or so? Look, I think somebody mentioned on, on Clay last night, his guest, uh, Seamus' guest said that he wouldn't be surprised if Glenn Ryan walked at the end of the league campaign. Like, yeah. the way things are going, it doesn't look that way. But even Colin O'Rourke emphasised that a few car fans coming out of the game emphasised that Glenn Ryan is... Um, like a domineering effect on Kildare football. He was the captain of that um, 2000s uh, Leinster winning team. He's a legend in Kildare football history. And if you can't play for Glenn Ryan and Johnny Doyle and Anthony Rainbow and initially last year, Dorman Hurley and Paul Galvin, who are you going to play for? Like that's that's the main thing for uh, Kildare. And it's the frustrating thing in many ways for them. And I feel sorry, I genuinely feel sorry for their fans to go through that, what, what they've gone through in the league. But I still think there is an inkling there that they will come to their best of, abil- best of their ability eventually this season. Yeah, I don't know though, because like I haven't, I haven't seen Kildare play well for a full 70 minutes, probably since Ruscommon maybe last year. Could argue against Monaghan, maybe fair enough. You know, he only narrowly, narrowly lost that game, obviously in the in in, in the pre- preliminary round. But yeah, I, I don't know. It, I think it's one of them where fair enough. You can have Anthony Rainbow, Johnny Doyle, um, Glenn Ryan. You can have absolute legends of the of the game there. But at the end of the day, just because they're great players doesn't necessarily mean that they're great coaches or great managers. And they might be able to motivate the players. They might be able to get get them up for a game. As we've often seen with Kildare in the last couple of years, like against Dublin and Crow Park, that time when they were in Division One a couple of years ago, against Ross Common, like they're able to get maybe a bit of a um a, a bit of bite out of players every now and again. But in terms of coaching, in terms of setup, in terms of tactics, they seem to be absolutely miles off it. Because even when I was watching Armagh against them, like just they just looked at sixes and sevens and um. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think I do think it is bleak, bleak times um, from from a Kildare perspective. Uh, Mead Man says I really don't see the hype around Kildare being this big county, and it being crazy that they're heading to Division Three. They haven't won Sam since nineteen twenty eight, and Leinster since two thousand. Yeah, it it is a fair point. Uh, yet they get pipped as the county with history of the likes of Mead and Cork. Division Three is their level, so. There we go. There we go. Uh, certainly shots for it there. Like I do think Kildare in terms of players that they've had in the past, like even Kildare around like the late two thousands, early twenty tens, were still a very good team. Like got to an all Ireland semi final, obviously in twenty ten as well. So um, they should be aspiring for more. And maybe I do agree. They're 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 not steeped in the history that Mead and 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 Cork have. To be fair, but um, but there we there we go. Speaking of Mead, they got a draw versus Cavan, 11 points apiece. Um, very, very close game. Mead could have won it at the end. They had that opportunity to uh, hit the post. A um, couple of very, very big goal chances as well. Both sides maybe happy, happy-ish to come away with a draw. Like, I mean, it means Mead 
certainly don't have any uh, worries about relegation now. Um, and I suppose Cavan still have a, an outside chance of promotion, albeit they will have to beat our man a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, it's um, it was a sort of a game I was watching this. Um, it, it, both sides seemed a bit nervous and they didn't want to lose. And both sides, I don't think, played to their best of their ability. Um, Mead and Baird as a defence, I thought they were really, really good. Um, Donald Keoghan, Adam O'Neill, particularly in that full back line, were excellent at clearing um, the danger. Cavan struggled against it in the game. A lot of attacks broke down. And they had, I think, a very bad shock. So you have to double check this because they did stats in the game. But like they have to improve on that if they want to be serious about promotion. But what I will say about both of these sides, I think Thomas Niblock mentioned this on the BBC commentary when I was watching it, that both sides performed badly to an extent, but both sides didn't want to lose the game either. And both sides were determined to keep their unbeaten records going in, in a sense. So fair play to both sides for um, producing a decent enough game. Both sides could have won it late on. Like I, I think me player hit the post. I'm not entirely sure who was the guy that hit the post. Then uh, Kieran Brady from Calvin balloons into the sky. You know, just think it was just nerves to the very end. But both sides put their bodies on the line. Both sides um produce heart and desire. Um, not the best game for quality, but look, I think me they're on a very good um state at the moment. I do think there's good young players there. Let's not forget Conor Gray and John Morris are both out injured. If they get back into the team. They could go places, but look, yeah, I think a draw was a fair result. Um, me performed well in the first half. Cavan did well to come back into it in the second half. But um, ultimately, honours even, and even look at the shot accuracy here, both sides, the Cavan at 40% and Mead at 45%. They're probably Chelsea. This wasn't the game for the ages whatsoever. And um, But look, both of them were at hungry. Both of them got the point. And... Both of them will be safe uh, to stay in San Maguire. And I think that was the ultimate aim for both. I know we were safe anyway, but they are safe from relegation for Division 3. And I think that would, would have been the aim for these two sides at the start of the season. Yeah, Billy Flynn says here, Mead have lost once in their last 11 games. Huge improvement since Offaly, uh, since Offaly win, uh, reason 14. Um yeah, yeah, look, absolutely. Um, they, they, they're they on a very, very good run at the minute. Um, obviously, a lot of those results were against, you know, Townshend Cup level opposition. But I do get your point, in fairness, since that Offaly, since that Offaly defeat in Leinster, you can only beat what's in front of you. Um, and Mead, more often than not, have had some, some very good wins. And I think the thing that impresses me the most about Mead is the resilience within their team. Um, like, because I remember watching them against Loud and there was multiple moments in that game where I thought they were going to get beat. From looking at this game, there was multiple moments where I thought Cavan had them, and they found a way to get something from it. We mentioned, obviously, Fermanagh on the opening day as well. They didn't play well that day, and they got a draw. Like That's been something that's been missing with me for, for quite a while, actually, I think. Um, it's just that resilience to dig out results when you're not particularly playing well. So um, I think that will give Mead fans a, a good bit of confidence. Not to say that they haven't, played well like they certainly have had you know great at attack of moments but i just think there's been moments in the last couple of games where mead of a couple of years ago i think lose them games whereas now they're starting to get results which i think is a is a positive anyway it's a massive positive and the fact they're digging out results by defending as a unit i think that is a positive because when you come up against teams like i know the Leicester championship is a foregone conclusion but if you're going to come up against teams like a dublin what we mentioned earlier on the chat, they're going to have a lot of the ball. And what we need to be do is to be stubborn. And this team have shown it. They do have good young players like Shane Walsh, for example, like Matthew Costello, like Jordan Morris, like um, Connor Gray. But they have tough tacklers there as well. Like Adam O'Neill is a real find at fullback. You have Donald Jogan there. You have um, Harry O'Higgins, who came on the other night, did very, very well. And then, um, yeah, Kieran Caulfield is another good player. There are some tough tackling players in that me team. And it's almost like the me teams of old, not necessarily the quality and things I like have from the 90s, the Trevor Giles, the Graham Garrity's all them, but certainly the absolute um, shithousery players like, uh, Colin, like uh, Colin Coyle or Colin O'Rourke himself. Like these players know what it takes to be a me footballer. And that's the main thing about this me team. They aren't the most perfect team, I think. To get them to the next level, they need to improve on their shooting. 
I think they need to hit over 50%, then 60%, then eventually 70% to get even better. But for right now, they're building good blocks at the moment. And Colm O'Rourke is a good coach. So I think Mead, they're on the right set at the moment. They're at six points. And honestly, over the last few games, I think they'll, they'll be favourites going to the car game next. And then, I, I'm not sure who they play in the last game now. I think it's... Um, oh yeah, who are they playing? Oh, Johnny Gall, sorry. Um, but still against Johnny Gall, they'll fancy their chances going into that game with Johnny Gall. Um, you know, they might even be up by that point. Yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, I, I think me, they're in a very good um, position at the moment. They're in the Sam McGuire Cup guaranteed. And, yeah, it all looks on the way up. And what I will say about me, I've said they're dark horses throughout the season because I see potential in them through the Talton Cup campaign and through other games, uh, challenge games and uh, board cups and stuff like that. I will say if there's any dark horse to get to the all Ireland quarterfinals this year, I think watch this space with me. There we go. There we go. Uh, our map big win for them versus for mana, 15 points to 11 um they have to dig this one out in in some ways as well like for mana i suppose being a very sticky team to be obviously in their in their own backyard albeit armagh were fairly comfortable in in certain parts um but yeah big results connor turbot three points from him stefan campbell with a couple of points there as well andrew mernon uh, connor turbot key mcconville all getting on the score sheet so yeah very very uh good win for Armagh and I suppose it puts them a step closer towards promotion it does and what this was always going to be a very very hard game for Armagh because for man always make it difficult as possible um coming up against them in Ulster so yeah it's um I, I'm good I, yeah I think Armagh did very well to come out with uh, winning this game like Stephen Campbell as you mentioned there like Andrew Moran coming back in as well scored a goal against Donegal and did very well in this game too uh, what I will say about Fermanagh, they've shown some great doggedness in this league. Like Declan McCusker, again, really, really good performance and probably one of the best um, performing wing backs in the country over the top two divisions, which is a credit to him. He's one of the top scorers from play, may I add. So, like, Fermanagh have been good performers, but I think they'd be kind of kicking themselves that they didn't get at least a point in this game. Like, they were level for some, for some time in this game. Armagh then went ahead and um, stuff like that. But look, Fermanagh will be happy with the performance. They go into the low game now next, and we'll talk about low to the goal in a bit. Um, they'll go into that thinking they have to go on and win this game uh, because that's a relegation for a binder now. The Cork did be killed there. So, yeah, it's a massive uh, few weeks ahead for Fermanagh to stay up in Division 2. They have done well so far, but they need to take it to the next step. And for Armagh, a win against Cavan, and they're up. Absolutely, yeah. Billy was saying here, lads, really enjoy the show. I could listen to you guys talk about GEA for hours. Keep up the the great work. Yeah, much appreciate, much appreciate it, and yeah, cheers for uh, for tuning in and and showing some support and everything else. Uh, much much appreciated. Keelan says here, uh, uh, don't think our mark are quite clicking yet or a full power. I was more confident uh, getting relegated last year and going into the championship than getting then uh, then getting uh, potentially promoted this year. Going into it, um, could be trying to change up to more uh, attack and football. Yeah, like that's the thing when the, when the shackles are let off for Armagh, I think they're a very very good side. Um, I remember, you know, I, I know I've referenced this game so many times, but when Armagh beat Dublin and Crow Park in the league a couple of years ago, they just went went at Dublin from the from the full from the first whistle, and it was obviously I didn't enjoy it at the time, but uh, you know the neutral. Sort of when I take my bias Dublin hat off, I can appreciate good football. And anytime I watched Armagh in what 2022, I think it was, um, they played some brilliant football throughout the majority of that year. And then last year it was it was very it was a lot more cautious and conservative. I think trying to shore things up defensively. So I think yeah, if Armagh can get back to playing, you know, fr- on the front foot attacking football, you know, playing the best to their potential. I think they could be they could be a force. They could be a force, and especially obviously Rian O'Neill. We've seen him in patches uh, this year, but um, you know, in the championship when he comes back, fully you know fully starting games, Armagh are going to be even better as well. In fairness, um, Gaelic Oises weren't an incredible performance, but just missed a couple of goal chances. Could have won the game by ten if we wanted. Um, I suppose that takes us on to the last game in uh, Division 2, which was Donegal 117, loud 15 points. Um, maybe, a, 
obviously there was no uh, highlights on the Sunday game or anything like that, so uh, very limited information, unfortunately, on this game. But um, what's, new hmm? what's new about load? <laughs> yeah, even if and they can't even use the RDE excuse this time. <laughs> Oh, we're going back to that now. And um, yeah, it's it's just ridiculous at this point. A, a boatload. Like, to be fair, they have shown load a lot more this season. But mm. like, again, like, like, there's no hurling on last night. They're not going to show the NGFA or the Camogie. So, like, show the game. You know, it's it's really, really boring. I'm sure TG Carr has cameras here. And they're show tonight. So, like, that's no excuse. It really isn't. But... On the game itself, look, it was a good win for Donegal. Jack McKelvey got the goal there. And um, Donegal got over the line. That was the main thing for them. Ocean Gallon, Paddy McBrearty to the four once again. Samuel Roy was the four for Lowe. But the next game for Lowe against Fermanagh, that's absolutely vital for them if they want to stay up. It is an RD, so it's advantage Lowe there. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's still going to be a tricky task for Lowe to go on and stay up. But it's actually mad to think that after five games, they've lost four and uh, won one. And that was the game against Cork and Ardy. So you, you wouldn't have thought that start the league campaign. You would have thought Lowe would be on the higher end of promotion. But they've fallen off um, the wagon a bit. But then, then again, they're playing a Fermanagh team who themselves have lost three games in a row. So you never know. Like This could be the game to bring confidence back into the Lowe team. Yeah, I still I still think loud of enough to to get themselves get themselves out of it. Like they've had a lot of narrow defeats as well. Um, you know the Cavan uh, game narrow defeat, our man narrow defeat. Even this, like coming up against a very good Donegal side, five point loss uh, away from home. You know, um, I don't necessarily think is the is the worst result in the world from a from a loud perspective. And obviously with Fermanagh and Kildare to play in the next two games, they still have more than enough. Uh, chances to dig themselves out of it the division two table uh looks a little like this um so we've got Donegal with nine points Armagh with nine points on there as well so both sitting first and second Cavan very much still in it seven points on the board Meter and fourth with six points Cork are fifth with four points for Mana six with three points Loud seventh with two points and Kildare five games five defeats um yeah make sure to check out at GEA league tables as well on Twitter or uh, on you know wherever you use your social media, make sure to check them out as well. They they are certainly by far the best at uh, putting up the GA league tables because um yeah RT and everyone else like they don't put them up till like Monday evening or something like that and it's you know it's just yeah so like they're in there and it it's just it's just a lot more handier so fair fair play um who who knew like league tables would be such a a, a, a massive step of innovation in the GA world, but there we go. That's uh, that's where we are in uh, in 2024. And a point to add as well, uh, Paul Flynn actually had a sheet on RT because Joanne took a photo last night. Of I've seen that. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're using people's stuff now. Aren't they? They're getting to that stage now. They're they're not taking this fast themselves. They're they're using other mm. people's content. It's all good. It's all good. It gets his name out there, and he deserves us. Uh, league tables is a brilliant account, I have to say. And um, I search for league tables. Look at that as well. Even look at um, the scores and stuff like that. Like I even double check my scores to see if the totals are correct as well. So fair play to whoever's running. I'm actually not sure of his name now, but it's a brilliant service. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, most certainly, most certainly is. Moving on to uh, Division 3, uh, start with uh, Clare. Big win against Limerick, 116 to uh, 14 points. Five-point result for Clare against their uh, near neighbours in Limerick. Um, yeah, big big result from a Clare perspective. Like It keeps them in the uh, in the promotion hunt. It does. And uh, how unfair is it for Clare that the only game they have lost so far is to that decision against Westmead and Mullingar? We keep going back to that decision, but mm. Clare are doing well in, in the last few weeks. Like Aaron Griffin's actually the top scorer from play jointly with Anton Sullivan and Liam Kerr at the moment with 11 points. He's performing well. Emmett McMahon is as well. Ikebo Guaru is doing well for Clare as well. Uh, the defensive line, like they are some very good performers. And Mark Fitzgerald has done a superb job, I have to say. <laughs> like even without the players that um, you know, left for travelling reasons or retired, like Owen Cleary, Keelan Sexton. Uh, Colin Collins was said the manager, Podge Collins. Like that's nearly the spine your that is the spine your team. 
and to miss those players to do well like this, four wins out of five, it's incredible. So fair play to Clare for that. For Limerick, doesn't look good for them, does it, Aaron? Um, at home, it was a comfortable enough loss. They were losing by 1-11 to five points at half time here. So they were never in this game and it looks like they're going down to Division 4. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a a long way back from uh, from a Limerick perspective, and yeah, clear keeping themselves uh, in the hunt, and, and maybe it is a shame that Westmead and Down just keep on winning, um, because clear no matter what they're doing, they just can't seem to to crack into the top two. But Westmead and Down do play each other next week, so maybe there might be an opportunity potentially for for clear to uh, to sneak into that top two, depending on results. Westmead got over the line against Antrim, 13 points to nine. Uh, it is interesting looking at Westmead's results this year because they haven't been blowing teams away by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it like it feels like a lot of their games have been a bit of a grind and they've, they've had to dig it out a lot of the times. But look, 100% winning record so far, um, albeit maybe, as you said, the controversial win against Clare. But um, yeah, it's looking like this might finally be the year where Westmead get out of Division 3. Yeah, yeah, very good performances again from Senna Baker and Round Round No Two here. So good win for Westmead and they've down next, which is going to be a big um task for them to go ahead and win that game. But they're in the driving season. That's what we predicted all at the start of the season that Westmead and Down will be up there. As for Antrim, that's three losses in a row now, isn't it, Aaron? So like that's um that's a bit of a wretched bit of form for the Antrim boys and uh they're kind of thankful that Wicklow and Limerick have got no points on the board so far. So, um, yeah, Antrim, like they had a good start to the league in many ways, but it's quite drifted, hasn't it? Mm, yeah, what is it, four defeats on the bounce now? I think it's three. three. Is it five three, games? They three, won the... three defeats, yeah, three defeats. Yeah, they won the, they won the opening too, actually, Um, in, in fairness to them. So, yeah, um, looking looking very very good as well from a down perspective because they uh, beat Sligo two seventeen to one eight. Um, like I mean, when you're looking at Westmead, who are just about getting over the line in some of their games, but down are putting an absolute pace in on almost everyone that they're they're coming up against here. And like it's hard, like it, it's hard to know really, like with w- when you're looking at Division Three and everything else. But when you look at down putting up these score lines, Liam Kerr. Uh, putting in a, a big performance, Pat Haver and scoring seven points. Um, uh, you, you know, you've got Caelan Doherty, obviously QQ footballer in there with a goal and two points. Like you've got down, down are looking very, very good. It's hard to really know what level they're actually at because of obviously playing in division three, but like a kind of, and I'm not saying the same thing is going to happen here, but it kind of reminds me a bit of when Derry were in division three and they just absolutely walked a, a couple of years ago. Yeah, and um, they're looking really, really good. And like for Down, I thought the first uh, four games, like it was against little, op- you know, opposition that wouldn't be at the higher end, the likes of Antrim, Offaly, um, Wicklow, Limerick, um, in no particular order. And you were thinking, okay, they have to face a big team now, like a Clare, like a Sligo, like a Westmeath. They face Sligo. Sligo could have pulled off a shot. They were a winning run of their own with three game wins of the boats. But Down just whipped them. With them, this was a brilliant performance from them. And um, Caleb Doherty, especially with one two in this game, like was absolutely superb. And they have scored the most amount of goals out of all the 32 teams in the league with 10 goals. They are a monstrous team down at the moment. But then again, like considering the draws the provincial championships and the way the championships going and stuff like that, even with these performances, they might still find themselves in the Tasman Cup, which I personally think, Aaron, that's a shame because this team deserves to be in the All Ireland Championship. because they are whipping everybody in this in this division. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Like, and um, it's it's going to be very interesting to see them um, potentially in Division Two next year. Albeit though, like it's mad because they've looked so good for the entirety of the year, but it isn't actually done and dusted yet because of the fact that they've got Westmead and Clare, isn't it, in their next their next yeah. two games. Um, so like it's it's looked very very good so far, but it's certainly not done. And um, which. Does sound a bit mad considering actually how good they uh, how good they've looked. Offaly got their first win of the season, a five fifteen to uh, to ten point win, a twenty point win uh, against Wicklow, which um, is mad. Like for two teams on zero points in Division Four relegation battle and everything else, like this is um, this is some scoreline for for Offaly to put up. And it probably just shows that they were just maybe unlucky in a few games, Offaly, whereas Wicklow. They're probably on the way back to Division Four, aren't they? And uh, while we're on goal scoring as well, 
down of the most amount with 10 goals, off of the second most with nine. It's hard to imagine their sixth place in Division 3 and the second most amount of goals out of all the divisions. It's mad, it really is. Uh, Jack Bryan is performing well. Um, he's starting to, um, Anton Sullivan as well, Cormac Egan hit the back of the net in this game as well. So they took the chance in this game, weak up paid, and it was a brilliant result for Offaly. And you'd imagine now they have to play Limerick in the next two games. Yeah, I think they should be safe, shouldn't they? Absolutely, yeah. Like I think it was one of them with the way that the fixtures worked, with the fact that all the relegation battling teams all play each other in the final couple of games. Um, it, it probably meant that Offaly ended up with 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 zero points, obviously considering a, a couple of disappointing results to the likes of Westmead down and obviously uh, Clare as well. But yeah, Offaly very very strong performance, um, very good win, and I think good to see as well because I don't, I don't you know. It would, be, it would be a massive shame to see Offaly uh, drift down to Division 4. I think they are a lot better than um, than, than a Division 4 side. And, and if anything, they should be pushing to uh, to get out of Division 3. Uh, in fairness, this is how the uh, league table looks. So, as we, we were saying, down in Westmead, both with 10 points, clear with 8 points. Uh, Sligo with 6 points. Antrim are in 5th with 4 points. Offaly 6th uh, with 2 points. And Limerick and Wicklow are both level with uh with zero points um yeah moving on to uh division four then um it was a little bit chaotic in division four this weekend they had a couple of uh mad results none other than wexford turning over carlo 114 to seven points a 10 point win who saw this coming not me i will see this like it's uh, to be fair i don't see much stuff coming but enough about me more about the Wicklow team like yeah or wexford should i say Long, long evening. Um, yeah, Wexford brilliant performance. Like Ben Bronson getting a goal in the second half. Um, like Owen Nolan had a good performance as well. Like, it's Dan Malone. Like, there are some good players in Wexford that they just needed a performance like this to produce it. And I didn't expect them to come this weekend. And I suppose Wicklow or Wexford are kind of like this, aren't they, Aaron? Like, they, they were poor the last few weeks. Then they turn up against Carlo unexpectedly out of the blue and produce a very good performance. So, well done to any, anybody in Wexford. And it's definitely blowing the promotion race wide open in uh, Division 4. Absolutely, yeah. Like, I mean, that that is the thing with Wexford. Like, every now and again, they just produce a result out of nowhere. It's like they have this sort of ace in their sleeve or this little trump card where they just, um, you know, decide to turn up every now and again. Um, yeah, Gaelic always saying it was seven each and then Wexford took off flying. Um, yeah, it does seem that when Wexford get going, because remember last year when they beat Offaly, wasn't it, in the Talchin Cup as well? Um, and remember they beat them in the Championship a few years ago as well. So Wexford do seem to just turn it on out of absolutely nowhere. Longford, massive win for them because um, Leitrim could have took the initiative um, with uh, Carlo obviously losing to Wexford. That didn't happen. Longford have putting themselves right back into the promotion race after what was a very difficult start. Uh, Darren Gallagher in there with six points uh, in midfield. So very strong performance from him, from what I've heard. And yeah, for Leitrim, it's um, it's disappointing, isn't it? Because you look at it, three wins on the board. Two of those wins came against Waterford and London. So like you're just looking at it and thinking, like fair enough, with Carlo losing, it does mean that the promotion is still there for them. But yeah, ma- massively disappointing from from a Leitrim perspective, but huge for Longford. Massive for Longford, and uh, Darren Gallagher deserves all the flowers that he's getting at the moment. Brilliant performance by him. But Cahill McCabe with one two deserves a mention as well. Brilliant performance by him at corner forward. But for Leitrim, as soon as Jack Gilhoney gets that red card, it's like yeah, that's that's about it. Um, Longford were in, co- in control of that game towards the end of it, and um, yeah, it's definitely another result that's pro- blowing the promotion race wide open. And uh, like there's four teams now at six points. I know we we'll bring up the table later, but like, if you want a promotion race finally poised, Division 4 is the place to go. Mm. It absolutely is, yeah. Like, and it was kind of looking like it was going to be a, you know, a two-horse race for the second place position. And and now Longford and, and Wexford have just completely uh, blown it absolutely wide open. Um, looking at the other two results, Leash, very comfortable result for them uh, against London, 212 to nine points. Uh, they've all but wrapped up their promotion. Uh, Evan O'Carroll with a goal and two points there. Mark Barry getting five points on the score sheet as well. So very, very good result there for Leash. And Waterford picking up their first point uh, of the league, uh, 113 to 16 points. I don't think many people 
including both ourselves, expected Waterford to get anything uh, in this division, considering how comfortably they've been B in a lot of their games. Um, but yeah, thoughts on uh, on both of them two results? Uh, Leash, pretty standard. Uh, brilliant result for them. They only need a point now to get up to the Division 3. And back where they belong, in all honesty. Now, London put up a good fight, but good result for Leash there. For Watford, it was a draw, and very well taken draw for them. But at the same time, even look at how it unfolded on Scorpio, I was thinking this is a chance for Watford to go on and win the game. I think they were 1-3 to no score up or something like that. Something yeah. ridiculous like that. And then... And then Tate come back into the game. Largely thanks to Sean O'Connor once again. Eight points, 131 in Division 4. And he's one of the top scorers in uh, the whole National League. Only top by Paddy Lynch from, Ka- from Cavan with 36. So, like, he performed well. He dragged Tipperary out of a hole in this one. But for Watford, I know it's a point. And it's a well-earned point for them in Simple Stadium. But I'm thinking it might be a missed opportunity to get a win as well. And we'd, I think it's the one county we'd all love to see win again, Watford. No matter what county you're from, you're thinking, please, lads, can we can you just come on and win the game? Because we'd love to see it. The joy in the war for mm-hmm. like war for footballers, I know they put a lot into um training sessions and all that. It'd be just so rewarding for them to get a win. But they didn't manage to do so yesterday, which was a disappointing one for them, I'd imagine. Yeah, Waterford still have to play London, I think, as well, don't they? Yeah, so maybe yeah. we're on the horizon there. Maybe, maybe, yeah. But at the same time, London will be looking at that and thinking it's a it's an opportunity for them for themselves to to get a win. Division four looks a little like this. Leash are comfortable. Five games, five wins, ten points on the board. Leitrim are second with six points. Wexford third with six points. Longford fourth with six points. Carlo fifth with six points. Tipperary are sixth with four points. And even Tipperary, who are actually are still in with a chance of promotion. London and Waterford are both in the bottom two with a with a point. Looking at it there, we we both think Leash are, are getting promoted um, with with ten points, obviously. But looking at it, five other teams are still in the mix there. Who's uh, who's who's getting promoted? Do you think? Just on a side note, it's mad that Tipperary are still in it after drawing at London and Watford, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's just you know, just just the mad nature of this division. Um, but who's one, going one on? win as well? Just one win in five games, which is yeah, mad, and they're still in it. And against Longford as well. Is it mad that Longford lose against Tipperary and then they beat Leitrim? It's just it's just bonkers, isn't it? It really is. Um, but I said Longford at the start of the season. I'm going to back Longford to get second. I'm going to stick to my prediction there. Hmm. Yeah, I said Leitrim at the start of the season. But to be honest with you, with the fact that they're playing Leash, I, 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 don't, I know Leash are, are pretty much already promoted, but I don't think they're going to take... The foot off the gas. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd probably go for Longford as well. I think they have the momentum now after that win. They have the momentum, um, and I could, I, I could see them, I could see them doing it. In fairness, I need to have a look back at the, at the fixtures and everything else. But I think I could, uh, I could see Longford doing it. Um, before we go, in terms of player of the week and moment of the week, what are you thinking? Player of the week, I'd probably have to go for Kieran Kilkenny for Dublin. Really, really good performance from him. Um, and as for moment of the week, difficult one. I suppose probably Wexford's performance in the second half against Carlo because it's mm. just something I've seen. Uh, seven points apiece, as the commenter have just mentioned there. The score one seven one out reply towards the end is absolutely incredible. Yeah, in terms of player of the week, yeah, Kilkenny, I think, does definitely deserve a huge show. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, Brian Fenton, I think Rory Cunningham was very good for Galway. Caleb Doherty, very good for Down. Um, I, I, yeah, maybe, maybe with, for once I won't go with a Dublin player and I'll go with Rory Cunningham because a goal on three points and um, that goal with, uh, like he scored was, was absolutely brilliant. And some of his points were... Absolutely sensational as well. And in terms of moments of the week, um, yeah, I suppose it's a it is a tricky one. You probably would look at Wexford's win, Longford's win as well. Dublin digging it out uh, against Derry. Probably go with Longford's win against Leitrim just because they had such a tricky start to the league. A lot of question marks, obviously, over Paddy Christie and and everything else. And um, they've managed to turn it around and now have a fantastic chance for promotion. So. 
yeah, look, I suppose we'll uh, go ahead and wrap this up here. Matthew, cheers very much for coming on the show. Anyone who tuned in, if you could hit the like button and subscribe, uh, it would be very much appreciated. And anyone who is tuning in on uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, if you could uh, leave the podcast a uh, rating, that would be absolutely brilliant as well. So, uh, yeah, cheers, Matthew, for coming on. Cheers, anyone who tuned in. And we will speak to you all soon.